Good morning. And I want to say happy anniversary. No, my wedding anniversary is, sep is in September. I celebrate another anniversary of my heart surgery, which is in March, but this is my two-year anniversary with the Appleton Church, and I'm just so thankful to be able to celebrate it with you. Here are a couple of balloons. There are two of them, notice, to celebrate the second year anniversary. It's wonderful to be your pastor, and I thank you for, for allowing me to be your pastor. And I thank you for the fellowship and the friendship that we have together and for being able to do ministry together. I can't wait until we have our sanctuary full of your shining faces again and am thankful for you today. I want to tell you a story this morning as we start about a missionary in Africa who, who is living in a central mission station. And in order to make life a little easier, he tells a story about the fact that they had a small generator to supply electricity to the church and to his small home. <clears throat> Some natives from the outlying area came to see him one day and to visit him. And they noticed that hanging in the middle of his living room from the ceiling was a light bulb. <clears throat> they watched wide-eyed as he turned the little switch and the light went on and then he turned it and the light went off. One of the visitors, a somewhat high official of the area, asked, could I have one of those? To which the pastor said, of course. He thought he must want it for a trinket or, or for just a novelty thing. So the next time the pastor went visiting to the outlying district, he stopped in to see this, this uh, high official who had received the light bulb. And as he entered the hut, he noticed that up in the middle of the room, hanging on an ordinary string, was the light bulb. He explained that one needs electricity and a wire to bring the current to the bulb to give light. Now, while we may share an, an understanding smile of the innocence of this African native, let's think about the fact that we may really not be much better because how can we as the Atholton Church hope to be the light to community if we're disconnected? If we're not connected, or perhaps this morning you feel a need to be reconnected? It's been a hard year, and in many ways some of us are feeling disconnected in various ways disconnected from our families. For the first time ever since we've had children, we have not spent Christmas with our children and our grandchildren. We actually drove half of the way there to Washington, Pennsylvania, and had a little Christmas celebration on high on a hill at a park under a shelter house in the cold, in the outdoors to be safe, just so we could exchange presents with our grandchildren. We haven't been able to meet in church, but just a few times. It's almost been a year. Some of us are feeling disconnected. So let me suggest to you that the story that I want to look at this morning from John chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, is a perfect illustration to talk about being connected and talk about being reconnected. If you've been part of our prayer line, we've been studying this passage all week. And it's interesting that when Phoebe was planning the prayer line activities for the week, she did not know that I was going to be preaching on this, on this text on this day, during the middle of our study on the prayer line of John chapter 15. So I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 15, Verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> J 
Jesus says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. <clears throat> every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, you've heard this passage before. It's a familiar passage. Let me just remind you of the setting. This is on the very same night of the Last Supper. In chapters 13 and 14, they celebrated the Last Supper together in the upper room. And by the time we get to chapter 15, they have decided to walk out of the upper room. And they're walking across, out of the upper room, across the Kidron Valley, and the next stop is the Garden of Gethsemane. I've, I've made this walk. I see it in my mind's eye, walking out. And up ahead is the Mount of Olives. At its base is the, the Garden of Gethsemane. Off to the right is what's called the Valley of Hinnom, which is where they had the, the dump and the burning. And so it kind of be called, became called Gehenna. And it's the symbol in the Bible for the burning hell. So I'm, I, I'm thinking about this in my mind, walking down, and I see Jesus with his disciples walking out of the city. And in the book Desire of Ages, Ellen White talks about the fact that as they are walking through this valley, the valley of, of, the, the, valley of the Kidron Valley, as they're walking through, they see a grapevine in the moonlight. And this seeing of the grapevine has Jesus now sharing about the vine. It's, it's interesting to me how often it seems that Jesus gave stories based upon the things that were around them. And so he begins talking in John chapter 15 about the vine. Now the vine was a very important symbol of Israel. You find it in the Old Testament all the time. Um, oftentimes, it, it, it's a negative context because Israel is, is not a good vine. It's a disconnected vine uh, or a grape leaf or a, bun, a bunch of grapes. Uh, this symbol of the vine and the grapes was used in many places in the ancient world in Israel. <clears throat> when, the, when the Jewish uh, Maccabees threw off the hated Romans in about 168 BC, they minted their own coins and on the coins was a, bun a bunch of grapes. It was an important symbol. Uh, during the first and second revolt, what's called the Bar Kokhba revolt, they also used the same symbol, the vine and the, gr and the grapes. It was a national symbol, and so much so that in the temple they had a beautiful, pure gold vine that was over the gate going into the temple. And it was always being added onto by some rich donor who would have a beautiful new, uh, a beautiful new bunch of grapes with some leaves uh, made and, and added, to the, added to the vine. It was a symbol of Israel. But notice that Jesus says something very different in chapter 15, verse 1. He says, I am the true vine. Israel is not the true vine. It is not connection with the national state of Israel that will secure a man or a woman's salvation. Jesus says, I am the true vine vine. What a contrast to, to the, the, the nation of Israel who had become disconnected to God. But Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Now, I probably would have thought that Jesus would say, my father is the true vine and I'm part of it. And no, that's not what he says. He says, my father is the vine dresser. And 
The father has a different role. And it really is in chapter, or chapter 15, verse 2, about the pruning and stuff. And we're not going to cover that today. Maybe another time we'll cover the idea of the pruning. But I want to spend time really on verses 4 and 5. In verse 4, Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Jesus is talking about the importance of a connection with him. The importance of a daily relationship with him. Now the word abide is a very interesting word. Some translations translate this Greek word with remain, some stay. The word in Greek is a word meno, meno. And it uh, is used 102 times in the New Testament and it's used 33 times in John. So you would see that John loves this word. It's a meaningful word to him. He says, abide, Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. Now, in order to help you get the flavor for what this word meno means, in order to help you get a flavor for its significance, I want to look at another, another few translations, a number of different ones. The one we've just read, the English Standard Version, it's also the New American Standard, the King James and the New King James, says, whoever abides in me and I in him. So you have that word abiding. But I wouldn't say the word abide is one that we use a lot today. I wouldn't say that it's common everyday use. I'd say there are weeks that go by that I don't use the word abide. And so what are some other nuances of meaning for this word? Well, in the complete Jewish Bible, uh, yes, there is a complete Jewish Bible. There is a Jewish Bible that's written in Hebrew and is translated into English, and it's for Jewish Christians. It says this, those who stay united with me and I with them. You start to get the idea of meno. It has to do with connection with Jesus. Those who stay united with me and I with them. Another translation, the contemporary English version, says this. If you stay joined to me and I stay joined to you. We're beginning to focus in on what this really, really means what meno means. Uh, God's word translations and also the amplified translation says it like this. Those who live in me while I live in them. You're getting the idea here of a close relationship that's continual. Another translation, the NIV and the RSV says this. If you remain in me and I in you. The remaining has the idea of, of constancy. Uh, the Young's literal translation tries to bring it home a little bit more. He says, he who is remaining in me and I in him. Now, what, what Young tries to do, and without getting too technical into the Greek, what Young tries to do is he tries to interpret the verb in this passage as a continuously acting verb. Not something that just happens once, but it's an action that continues to happen. And so he's emphasizing, he who is remaining in me, it's a ongoing daily experience. He who is remaining in me and I in him. The Wycliffe Bible says this. It says, he that dwelleth in me and I in him. Dwelling. Uh, frankly, though, my favorite translation is from the uh, translation not many people have ever seen. It's a translation from the FJZV, the Frank J. Zolman version. And it says, whoever connects and stays connected to me, 
I will stay connected to him. You see, it's talking about an experience with Jesus that is a connected experience, a constant one, a continual one, abiding, living, joined with Jesus. That's what Jesus wants with you and me. Whoever gets connected and stays connected. It's a very significant word. And if you, if you take it to its logical end, connected, being connected with Jesus, equals life. But being disconnected from Jesus equals death. Now, this may seem serious because I've seen some people lately who it seems as though they have become disconnected from the vine because of circumstances, because of illnesses, because of quarantine. It just seems like many people are feeling disconnected from Jesus in the church. And if we were really talking about vines, then I got bad news for you. You're dead. Because disconnection from the vine means death. But here's the good news. Jesus is so powerful that even if you're disconnected today, you can get reconnected. It's different than the vine that grows out in the garden. If it's cut off, I suppose there are some vines that if you put them in water, maybe they may re-root. I think they might. But this is the good news in the spiritual life. If you're disconnected from Jesus, it doesn't mean you're dead and you're going to die. If you're disconnected from Jesus, Jesus allows reconnection. Good news. Jesus allows reconnection. Not only does he allow reconnection, he's an expert in reconnection. Because that which was once dead can be alive again. He did it in the Bible. Lazarus, the little boy. People who were dead, Jesus can bring back to life we can be reconnected. Now, in this age of internet and age of Zoom, <clears throat> we know a lot about reconnecting. As a matter of fact, I despise the word reconnecting, especially when it's accompanied by that little circle. Oh, come on. And... Um, it's not good news. When you go on reconnecting, it's usually not good news. Uh, perhaps you've heard the story about the, the boy. He was a fourth grade boy. Now, this is a little bit scary. He was a fourth grade boy that discovered that when he was on class, in class, on Zoom, he discovered something that could fool his teacher. Most of you have probably heard of this. He renamed himself on Zoom to reconnecting, dot, dot, dot. He renamed himself and he timed it so that he could exit his video and his audio at just the perfect time that reconnecting flashed up on the screen. And so he fooled his teacher. His teacher thought that he was having problems with connecting and the truth was he was just smiling and he was skipping class. He went and did everything he wanted to, and the, the, sign, the, 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 the sign across the screen said reconnecting, and his teacher thinks there's a problem. Well, that worked for a little while, but teachers are smarter than you think, students. There's another story about a little boy who heard about this, and so he tried it, he tried it on his own before it became a well-known phenomenon. It made its way and it made, it made itself to be viral. Well, he tried it too, but his teacher caught on immediately because he spelled reconnecting wrong. R-E-C-O-N-E-C-T-I-N-G. And his teacher busted him immediately. You know, listen, students, I want you to know this. <clears throat> Your teachers at Athelton Adventist Academy know this trick. Do not try this at home. 
because they know this trick now. If they didn't know it before, they do now if they listen to this sermon. I'm sorry. But they know it now, so do not try this. But what Jesus is talking about here is not that, but he allows reconnection. Now, oftentimes when I see my screen go on reconnecting with that endless circular circle of death, I, I call it, <clears throat> you don't think you're going to get reconnected. But let, let me tell you, I promise you, that Jesus will let you reconnect to him if only you ask. If only you will ask. Back to verse number 4 in, in John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verse 4. <clears throat> Jesus says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. You notice the word abide in here. Again, Jesus wants to have this relationship with you that's continual. He wants to have this relationship with you that never ceases. Like, like a, a vine depends, like the fruit of the vine depends on the branches. He wants you to bear good fruit, which is necessary for you to have a connection. Now, the natural outcome... <clears throat> of the branches being connected to the vine is that the vine will bear fruit. Now, we're talking here about grapevines, but it's true for all, all plants. You know, when I was a kid at home, we had this huge grapevine. I mean, it was the best, biggest grapevine in the world, and it bore absolutely no fruit because we didn't know how to take care of grapevines. Now, I knew, I knew how to take care of sweet corn, uh, we knew how to do soybeans. We had hundreds of acres of soybeans. We knew how to do beets. We knew how to do tomatoes. We knew how to do green beans. In southern Indiana where I lived, we grew some of the best watermelons that you'll ever see in your life. Cantaloupes. Our, our, when my father was home, at least, our garden was about two acres. I mean, we raised a lot of food but we didn't know what to do with grapevines. So we had these big, huge, wonderful grapevines, but we didn't realize that in order to have good grapes, you have to cut the vines back. We didn't want to disconnect anything. And in this passage, it talks about the pruning, but the purpose of the pruning is so it will bear more fruit. I did learn this about apple trees. Apple trees have to be pruned in order to give good apples. And so I learned that very, on, very early in my, in my teens. My father had been gone by then. And so I began cutting and trimming uh, the apple trees. We had about 10 apple trees. And I would go out every day and I would, uh, not every day, but I would go out in the spring before, this, before really too much was happening. And I would cut all the branches off that were growing inside the tree. Uh, they call those branches suckers. Because what they do is they suck the life out of the apple tree. They, these branches are not going to have apples on them. Simply will never have apples on them. All they will do is have pretty green leaves on them and suck all the juice out of the, out of the tree before it gets up to the apples themselves to produce apples. And so you have to, as Jesus says here, some has to be pruned away. But then... The rest, of the rest of the vine has to be connected with the ground. And the rest, of the, ap the rest of the apples and the watermelons have to be connected with the vine so that we can get good fruit. And Jesus is talking about the importance of producing good fruit through the branches. Notice in, in uh, John chapter 15, verse 5, I didn't read this part of the passage yet, but the very part, last part of the passage, it says, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. Now, I don't know if you find that a little hard to take, but, you know, I tend, I, uh, well, let's be honest. Uh, I was raised in, a, in an environment that when I was raised, I, I grew a little bit cocky in life. 
And my mother knew this. <clears throat> my mother knew the best way to get me to do something was to tell me I couldn't. You know what I mean? Oh, you wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah. I'll show you. So I, I ended up growing up just a little bit cocky. There was nothing I couldn't do, I thought. And so this passage, John 15, 5, is kind of hard to take. Without me, you can do nothing. And that sounds a little bit hopeless. But then you pair it with Philippians 4, 13. <clears throat> you know this text. I don't even need to turn to it. You know this text, Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Without me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. But Paul says, with Christ, I can do everything. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, this is why it's so important to be connected with Christ. And perhaps you need to be reconnected with Jesus. What happens in our lives when we are connected with Jesus? Something else happens. John 15, verse 11, <clears throat> Jesus is continuing on. He says, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. We've talked a couple times in this new year, talked about it at Christmas, talked about it the first Sabbath of the new year, having joy. I want you to have joy. And Jesus here again gives us the secret of having joy. He says, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. How do we have that joy? By being connected with Jesus. If you don't have joy in your life right now, let me question you. Are you really connected with Jesus? Or are you disconnected? If all you have is anxiety and have no joy, you better check the plug. Is it plugged in the wall? Are you connected to the vine? Because Jesus says, you will give you joy if you are connected with him. Do you have joy in your life today? Jesus is our joy if we are connected with him. But if you don't have joy, check your connection. Listen, <clears throat> let's just be honest. We cannot go a single day in life disconnected to Jesus. We cannot afford to, especially in this time in which we live. How close are we to the end of time, to the coming of Jesus? I don't know. Certainly as we see all the things that are happening in our world today, it makes us feel like it must be at the door, but we don't know. But I do know that we are not guaranteed tomorrow. I do know that because of various sicknesses or accidents, People die every day that didn't expect to die when they got out of bed that morning. We cannot afford in this era of the world's history in which we're living, we cannot afford to go a single day without being connected. And if you can't honestly look at your life this morning and know that you are connected to Jesus, here's the good news. Jesus allows reconnections. We cannot afford to go a single day. With the Christian life, we cannot afford to take a vacation. We cannot afford to decide, well, I'm going to live like a Christian right now, but next week when I go on vacation, I'm going to do as I want. You know the old saying, what happens in Vegas, ha what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Not true. Not true. What happens nowhere stays there because we are living in a time when we, can, we cannot afford to take many, can, many vacations from being connected. We cannot afford to bend our connection to the branch, to the vine. We can't take, you, you've probably seen it, you, 
You take the, some vine and you bend it just a little bit and it's really pliable at first and then all of a sudden, snap! Disconnected. We cannot afford to bend our connection of the branch to the vine. We must be connected or reconnected to Jesus. So, in a very humble way, in a very, without sounding like I, I'm a know-it-all, I want to give you some suggestions on how you right now might reconnect to Jesus. If you're feeling disconnected, these are some steps I suggest to you on how you may reconnect to Jesus today. Step number one. Set aside all devices, cell phones, iPads. In some cases, even I'd have to take my watch off. Because when I get text messages in, I know it from my watch and I can read them on my watch. Set aside all devices. In other words, disconnect from the world before you reconnect to Jesus. Set all of them aside. Now, I know some of you say, well, I'll just put it over there. I don't have to set it too far away. I can ignore it, liar. You know, when, when, it's, when my phone is far away, it, it, it's this weird thing that happens. I have an iPhone, and I almost never have the ringer on but I have the, the, the vibrator on. And if I set it on a metal, oh, I'm sorry, on a wooden surface like the top of my desk, I can be in the other room and hear it vibrate on top of my desk. It's almost like my desk works as a drum. I have to turn it off. Am I good at this? No, I'm, I'm, not, saying I'm, easy, I'm not saying this is easy and I'm not saying I'm good at it. But in order to reconnect to Jesus, we have to disconnect from this world. So set all of your devices aside and open God's word. Read God's word. Here in verse chapter 15 of John verse 7, Jesus says this, again, abiding. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. You see that? If you abide in me, how can we abide in Jesus? What's the first step in abiding with Jesus? Abiding in his word. His word is the primary place where we can get information about Jesus. The word of God, the Bible, is the primary place where we can connect with Jesus. And if you're feeling disconnected with Jesus and you're not reading scripture, you're missing it. You have to reconnect with Jesus through the word. My words, he says, will abide in you. There's power in the word of God. When you open the Bible, ask him, speak to me and expect him to. Over the past few years, my wife and I both have been reading our Bible in, um, in various ways. But one of the ways that we've been practicing devotions is um, by just opening the Bible and letting it fall where it will and reading what, what it opens to and, and say this, Lord, speak to me in this, in this reading. Speak to me. Give me something that I need today. Have you ever tried this? Now, I don't necessarily suggest this as a way to make decisions. You know, I, you might have heard about people who do that. And oh, I'm going to read this and I'm going to open the Bible and it's going to make my decision. And I don't recommend that. But just for pure devotional use, let it open and read what Jesus has to say to you. Now, you can modify this idea because... Um, what. Well, it, it doesn't always work. But you can modify it by, by al allowing it to open somewhere in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Limit it to open it there. You can, you can make it do that. Or the book of Psalms. 
limit it to so, so you'll open to a psalm and won't open to Ecclesiastes. Uh, I'm sorry, to um, Exodus. Uh, for many years, I tried to read the Bible through. And there are problems for me to read the Bible through. Number one, I get so, I get so caught up in the, in the technical aspects of the text that I get through five verses instead of five chapters. That's my problem. But the other problem is that I'm not consistent sometimes. And so for a number of years, I tried to read the Bible through, starting from Genesis. And I have to tell you, I've become the world's foremost authority on the first 25 chapters of Genesis. <clears throat> That's about as far as I ever made it. So this works well. And, and take the Bible, open it, and say, speak to me, Lord. And I am just simple enough to believe that if you pray that prayer, he will. Reconnect to Jesus through Scripture. The second one is simple enough. After you've read Scripture, then reconnect with Jesus through prayer. And allow him, ask him again to speak to you in prayer. You may pray about what you've just read in the scripture. And there are a lot of people who pray their way through scripture. And actually make the reading of the, of the passage a part of their prayer. Which is an interesting idea. But pray. Perhaps some of you will will want to write your prayers out. I'm not a person who likes to write prayers out. But some people find a lot of value in writing prayers out. And unfortunately, um, unfortunately, many people's, the focus of their prayer time is prayer requests, is intercession. Spend some time praising God for who he is, thinking about what he's done for you. Communicate with God. Say, Lord, speak to me. You may not hear it through your ear, but I believe that if you approach him, he will speak to you. He's done it to me. Not every time I ask him, but he has led me in my life. You know, they say hindsight is twenty twenty vision. Whenever God has led me, I can see that it was the right choice, even though at the time it might have been painful. And then when you're praying, when you finish your prayer, this is a novel idea. When you finish your prayer, don't get up. Listen. I know you're busy people just like I am. And this is one of the hardest things. But when you're finished with your prayer, you're not through praying. Spend time listening and seeing what God might have to say to you. You know, you would think I was pretty rude if, um, if I called you on the phone and I, I called Tessa on the phone Tessa's running the camera right now, so I'm just looking at her. I'm picking on her. I call Tessa on the phone, and I say, okay, Tessa, remember we're having communion service on the, on the 12th, and um, we're going to need uh, this and that and this and that, and I need you to do that. And also, I'm preaching next Sabbath. I need you to do this. Thanks. Bye. And then I got off the phone, and I'd say, you know, funny thing about that, Tessa, she doesn't say much. Well, she didn't say much because I didn't give her a chance to say anything. Don't we treat God like that? If you want to reconnect with Jesus, spend time in prayer and then listening. Now, I, I have the problem, and I know some of you do too. I have the problem in devotionals, in devotional time, and in praying that my mind is too active. It takes me a while to be able to focus um, because invariably 
something will happen to distract me. And just because I get distracted doesn't mean I'm going to give up. I'm also very, uh, very task oriented and very driven on certain things. And so I remember things that I should do the rest of the day while I'm praying or while I'm having devotions. I remember them and it distracts me. And so what I do, and this may not work for everyone, but what I do when I'm having devotions and I have prayer time, I keep a sheet of paper beside me. And when something goes flying across my mind that I'm afraid I'm going to forget, I just write it down. And so what I've done is I've transferred it from my brain, from my brain to my, my paper, and now I don't have to worry about it anymore. I can go back to praying. This works for me. It may not work for everyone. Spend time in prayer. And specifically also in spending time in prayer, pray for the Holy Spirit. Pray for the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in you. Uh, back to John. I told you John loves the word abide. He loves the word meno. John chapter 14, just a chapter before this, same night, same setting, just a chapter before 15. John says, John 14, verses 6 and 7. I'm sorry, I put the wrong numbers down. It's 16 and 17. Jesus says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither, it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. You know, when we are dwelling in Jesus, when we are abiding in Jesus, when we're connected to Jesus, we're also connected to the Holy Spirit because Jesus sends him into our lives. And pray in your prayers. Pray to be receiving the Holy Spirit. Pray to reconnect to Jesus through the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit to lead you. The fourth thing I suggest to you to reconnect to Jesus. Now, this may sound strange. The fourth suggestion I have for you is get up and go outside. You know, Ellen White says, nature is God's second book. I struggle with this one a little bit. My wife gets this one 100%. Go outside. Look at the beautiful blue sky. Look at the white clouds and the white snow. In my backyard, <clears throat> there, there are only a couple cats in the neighborhood. So because we don't have many cats in my neighborhood, we have a ton of squirrels. And squirrels are my favorite animal. And so I love to see the squirrels out in my backyard, running up and down the pine trees, jumping, uh, running after each other. You know, it makes me smile. There's something about being outdoors in God's creation that reminds us of him. It helps us reconnect to him. Now, I know it's cold. <clears throat> Put another coat on. I have a friend who's from, from Norway, married a friend of mine, and she says... <clears throat> There's no such thing as bad weather, only bad clothing. So get up. It's supposed to be a decent afternoon. Get up and go outside and, and don't concentrate on, on other stuff. Don't let distractions come with, in your mind. Don't walk with your, your AirPod in and AirPod and talk to people on the phone while you're just bask in the, in the beauty of connecting with God. The next suggestion, number five, I have for you is to reconnect with one another. That's, you know, that's been one of the hardest things. I, I hear this week I heard the, our kids from Athlon Adventist Academy talk about what it's like to go to school right now. And one of the things they talked about was I miss my friends. You know what, church family, I miss you. We're, 
We're a little disconnected from each other in, in this pandemic, but it doesn't mean we have to be. This afternoon, <clears throat> I challenge you. Get on your telephone and call the person you miss the most. Now, I know probably some of you are already doing that, but make it a deliberate choice today. As a matter of fact, humor me and call three people, not just one. Call three people. Call people that usually sit around you in the pew. I don't know how long it's been since you talked to them, but when we're in church, talk to them. Call them. Talk to them. Reconnect with them. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. It's a wonderful passage that encourages us. Hebrews 13, 1. <clears throat> it's a very simple phrase. It says, let brotherly love and sisterly, by the way, continue. Reach out to someone. So I've encouraged you to reach out to someone, the person you miss the most. But here's another idea for you. Reach out to the person you miss the least. Because you know what? They probably haven't gotten a call from anybody. Reach out and call someone that you usually see across the church. You may not even know that person that well. But just reach out and call them and tell them you've been missing them. Reconnect to each other. Make a deliberate effort. We also have other opportunities to reconnect to each other. On Friday night, <clears throat> we're having our Zoom communion. If you're on communion, there will be a little time at the beginning for you just to give each other greetings. And I think you'll enjoy being able to see each other's faces and celebrate communion together. In a few weeks from now, I'm planning, I don't have a date, I'm sorry, but because of some of the technology involved, I'm not sure when we can pull it off, but I want to have something called the Athelton Party Line. It'll be on Zoom, and it'll just invite anybody that wants to come in and um, be on our party line. Now, I don't mean party as in balloons and um, cake although you can do that too, but I'll explain to you at another time what I mean by party line and understand when I say party line, I'm going to describe to you something that's 50 years old. And then there's the prayer line. You know, every single day, usually twice a day, we have a group of of prayer warriors who meet on our prayer line. This is not just for the prayer committee. This is for everybody. You see the information published weekly in the newsletter. You have a, we have a Zoom link there for people. It's for the whole church family. If you've been missing seeing the church family, this is a way to reconnect with them. Uh, you, you can, I'm not going to try to tell you when it is, but you can see it on our, on our email. It, just dial in, click in to Zoom and spend some time with the church family in prayer. Well, let me end by asking this question. Why is it so important to be reconnected? Why is it so important to be connected? Why is it so important to be reconnected that we're going to preach a whole sermon series on this subject over the next about 10 to 12 weeks? various aspects of reconnecting. Why is it so important? Well, it's because we cannot afford in this time in which we live to be disconnected. We cannot afford to be alone in our faith. I did a little bit of research on, <clears throat> on lions and wolves. Uh, many years ago, it's been uh, 15 years ago, I had the opportunity to go to Kruger National Park in South Africa. Incredible place to visit. We drove into Kruger National Park. There was um, a really horrific looking site. Right on the road, right in front of the, of the park entrance was a, a, a lion kill. And a group of lions had chased down a giraffe and had killed a giraffe and were devouring the giraffe right in front of us. 
It was, it was horrible. And the ranger said that oftentimes the lions do that because they chase the giraffes. They get them separated from each other and they chase the giraffes across the road and the slipperiness of the road often causes the giraffe to fall. And so they can pounce on it when the giraffe is falling. So here's this huge giraffe, giraffe and the lions are feeding on it. And I, I studied a little bit about the, 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 the hunting habits of lions and of wolves. And they have an interesting thing they do. Both will attack a group of animals, of prey, perhaps a, a, a herd of antelope, or even water buffalo. They'll do this to water buffalo, believe it or not. The lions will. And they attack the group, and their goal is to scatter the group. Their goal is to get one animal alone, separated from the group, disconnected from the group. And when they have that animal disconnected, it may be an old one who can't keep up with the rest. It may be a, a young one who can't keep up with the rest. It may be an injured or whatever. Once they get it disconnected from the group, they know that they're going to suffer because that's the secret of hunting. That's why it's so important to reconnect. In these days in which we live, that's why it's so important to reconnect. First Peter this is a familiar verse to you. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. It says this. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. That's why it's so important to be connected, reconnected. Because we have an enemy I like to read this passage like this. <clears throat> Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking Frank Zolman to devour. Let's personalize it. He's after you. And when we're disconnected from the flock, we're easy prey. That's why it's so important for you to be reconnected. Verse 7, before that, that's verse 8. Verse 7 says, to cast all your anxieties on Jesus because he cares for you. You see, what's the, what's the solution to the roaring lion who's trying to separate us, who's trying to disconnect us so he can devour us? What's the solution? Connection with Jesus. Reconnecting with Jesus. It's my hope for you over the next few weeks. We're going to sing together about Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. <laughs>